Well, today we have uh, Dr. Axel Meyerhofer. He's a very experienced presenter, thought leader, and expert in the field of leadership. Uh, he started his career in Germany as a fighter jet aviator, and then came to the U.S. through an exchange program where he literally took the job of a United States Air Force aviator flying F-111 fighter jets <coughs> while his exchange partner went to Germany to fly his ECR tornado. After six years in the U.S., Axel retired in the role of staff <coughs> officer and senior program manager for the Flight Training Center at Holman Air Force Base in New Mexico. He joined a boutique software company as an executive for four years and then found his own company, AMC LLC. Since 2005, he has been serving a long list of Fortune 100 companies like Cisco, Bayer, Boeing, Merck, State Farm, First Republic, and Green and Guggins. Axel specializes in leadership, and in the last few years, he has refined his approach by combining what he learned in 22 years in the military with experiences from his last 16 years in private industry. From all of his work, Axel has developed a model called Diamond Formation Leadership. He wants you to learn how to become a great leader through balancing four corners of the diamond, which are team building, globalization, cultural sensitivity, and collaboration. Let's welcome Dr. Axel Meyer. Thank you guys for having me. Is this loud enough or do we need the microphone? We need the microphone. I would need to need the what? microphone, okay. <laughs> what? Okay, better? Better. Better, okay. I have been wondering why Dan tried to talk me into using the projector. Glad I didn't bring any pictures or anything like that. So, um, cool presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Diamond Information Leadership that I wanted to introduce you to today. You see a little bit, uh, we put a little piece of paper out on each of the tables. Um, like Gerald was saying, it's based on my experience in the military and when you ask yourself, well, what the heck is diamond information for those that are not that necessarily familiar with leadership in the military context, is when you try, and this goes back all the way to the Vietnam War, when you try to get planes into the enemy territory, one thing you always want to avoid is that they detect you before you get where you want to go. And nowadays they spend enormous amounts of money to build the planes in a way that they are basically invisible on radar. Well, at my time, when I started in 1981 and all the way until basically 2000, it just kind of started in, in the 2000s. Uh, but during my whole career, the other way, if you didn't spend 100 million on a plane, to make that happen, is that you put the planes that you need to accomplish your goal or destroy the target, as we call it, as close together as possible. So when somebody is sitting at the ground looking at their radar screen, they see one blip not knowing that there could be four or eight or more planes all in one spot together. And only when you get close to where you want it to go did you basically spread apart and did your thing with your plane while your bodies did the same thing with theirs. Now, while you're going from where you started to where your goal is or your target is, the interesting part is that that can happen at night, that can happen in the weather, that can happen in fog, and for the flying that I have done in the military, that can also happen very close to the ground. And so what we really had to learn was, number one, trust the leader. That's the one, if you imagine a diamond like this, there's always one in the lead position. And those who are not in that position have to have pretty much the ultimate trust. Up and down, left and right, whether good or bad, visibility good or bad, night or day, you have to trust the leader. But the other thing is, you cannot get out of position. Because when you get out of position, two things happen. Number one, you no longer just one blip. You're now basically putting the whole gagger, as we call it in the Air Force, the whole team in jeopardy. Because the guys on the ground who want to shoot missiles and kill you, 
could detect you as more than just one blip. The other thing is that when you're out of balance, bad stuff happens. And that is not just true for flying, that is true if you look through your professional career or through your private life. When things are out of balance, they typically don't go so well, or at least not as well as they could. So when I started to look at what did I learn from my flying and how does this apply, diamond information leadership in the first aspect, in the first layer if you want to, goes to the idea to say, what do I need to keep in balance in my business operations, in my running my company, in my engaging my people that uh, follow my lead? And I came to the conclusion that it's four things that I found in the military, that I found when I was in, in the software company that you had mentioned, and that I found by serving the different clients and companies that I've been working with since 2001. And those four things were mentioned, and I would like to have a few minutes with you to go a little deeper, and maybe at the end we can talk a little bit about what are your experiences or do you have any questions about. If you ever, by the way, want to have some similar experience, and, you know, I don't know, um, if there's ever a chance to say, just grab, maybe, what was his name, Chris? Brad. 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 No. Brad? Oh, Brad. Okay, Brad, that's you. <laughs> so maybe he can finagle it to get us, you know, four planes and you can play around with that. <laughs> um, but if that's not so likely, if you want to try it for yourself just for a little bit, the beauty is that we have lots of interstates around here, right? So without jeopardizing the safety of your vehicle, I, I would challenge you to try to sit in your car driving down the interstate. Don't pick a day when it's really, really clogged, but when it's reasonably flowing. And then pick one thing that is kind of like in your right hemisphere of you. You could take the right edge of the mirror or you could take some piece of the, of the right side of the car or something like that. And then one more thing on the car in the next lane over. And just try how hard it is in two dimensions going down the interstate to keep exactly that position. That alignment between where you sit, the thing in your car, and whatever you pick, like maybe the mirror or something like that on the other car. Not moving forward or backward or so forth while you're going through traffic. What you will find is you're constantly fine-tuning. It's not just I put my, my speed to 65, I know the other guy is going 65 and it just goes down like that. There comes a curve, you have to adjust one way or the other. It goes up and down, you have to adjust one way or the other. Now, when you get that experience for yourself, and I hope you still remember that we talked about this today, then you imagine somebody took the road away. And you have to do this in three dimensions. And that's what I feel oftentimes happens when people get elevated into leadership positions. And there are two dimensions that they're actually relying on or referring to is that they got promoted in the leadership position because they were good at management. And what does that mean? Management is basically somebody said, okay, you start in Chula Vista and you go to Escondido to meet Axel, and all you need to do is basically a little bit of 805 and then up the I-15. But that doesn't necessarily mean what to do when somebody says we know where we are and we don't know where we want to go and you have to figure it out. That's the third dimension. So with that in mind, that I hopefully gives you a little bit of a foundation, a little bit of a basis, why do I believe that with that in mind, those four corners of the diamond that on the one hand in my flying career represented those four planes, but when you translate it into business, what does that mean for us in business when we are in leadership roles or need to be in leadership roles for the day to day? And what I believe the first one, and they're not necessarily in priority order because I hope I made it clear, each one of those corners, each one of those diamonds, each one of those planes is as important as the other one. It just so happens that one needs to be in the plane, so th uh, in the front, so that the others have a reference. To my example, if that other car isn't there, you can't be information. You're with yourself. <coughs> so, starts out with collaboration. I believe in our day and age with more and more technology, with more and more things going on, whether we listen to the news, we listen to what comes up in technology, we listen to the generational requirements and desires that people have that they want from their leaders and from their management, 
the only way to really create a cohesive team that works together is that you have ways of collaboration. The first one is with your immediate leadership team, the four, five, eight people that you work directly with. Some people call those the direct reports. The next layer then are your managers, depending on the size of your organization. The next layer are the people that are following those managers. But it goes beyond that. It also goes to where do we get our stuff? Whether it's the support equipment that you need, or if you're producing something, where do we get our supplies? Who are our competitors? Who are the people who help us legally, who help us from an accounting point of view? And not every organization is as big as, as the Boeings and the Bayers that I have had the pleasure to serve, where everything is in-house. It's more likely these days that you get these things from the outside. And I can guarantee you, your leadership and where you want to go and where you want to take your organization or your business or your endeavor gets better when those that support you from the outside are clearly informed and collaborating with you on your behalf, rather than just simply providing a service. I use the analogy, if you look at taxes, I know it's not tax season right now, to say, okay, the forms that need to be filled out are one set of forms. You could theoretically go to the IRS, download the set of forms, and get somebody to fill them in. The difference to collaborate with a CPA or an accounting firm and just filling it out on TurboTax or going to H&R Block is that there is a collaboration happening that is informed by your goals. Because you can probably do it a thousand different ways, and your right way comes from that collaboration. So you have external collaboration, you have immediate co collaboration within your team, and then you have the collaboration organization one. That's one of the core. <coughs> Pretty right. All right, he's ready now. The second corner, and that goes right in with it, is team building. And one thing that I have a pet peeve about is that I all would like to invite all of you to ask yourself, have you recently, let's say in the last two or three years, if you are in business and active, taken any form of a personality or style assessment? And then if the answer is yes to that, so if you did, then you know what your style is, then have you done it with your team? And it's really up to you how wide you want to spread that or not. But what I'm getting at, why I'm pushing pointing this out in the context of team building is, we have a tendency as a human tenant, as a human nature kind of thing, to hire the people that are similar to us. So if you have a very direct style, you say, okay, I'm pretty similar to like a policeman or a fireman or something. When the place is on fire, I direct them to the exit and get them out of here before something bad happens. And that's your style. It's not that likely that you bring in somebody who has a very elongated way and needs 20 pages to describe something and three hours to give you some idea of what this, the issue is. Because when you talk to them, you will find them long-winded and sometimes boring. You want, hey, tell me what A is, tell me what B is, and let's figure out the shortest distance. So we have a tendency, if we don't have awareness about our style, to hire the people that are similar to us. So I encourage you in the context of team building to really build a strong team. You can go DISC or different other kind of models, but find something, some model that informs you is what's your style. Are you the direct, are you the analytical person, are you the team player person, are you more the artistic creative person? Whichever one you are, there's no good or bad about it, just the awareness, this is who I am. And then ask yourself in your current situation, how many of the folks around me that I directly influence every day are like that? And how much have I allowed myself to create some diverse team so that I get all these different perspectives? the analytical perspective, the team perspective, the direct perspective, and the artistic or creative perspective, or innovative, like some people call it today. That, I believe, is the most important component of team building. You can train people almost on anything, but you have to have the right people with the right talents to begin with in the door. The second thing that I really highly recommend is when you do the interviews and bring them in, ask them, what they want to achieve in the next three to five years. And don't limit it to the job. You will then much easier find out if these members of the team that you are considering 
are really going to be members that are interested and in, in inspired by what your business or what your activity is for. If you find out that their main goal is to support their family, make a paycheck and do a good job, that's all nice, but that is probably not exclusively aligned with where you want to take the business as a leader. So that component is how much can I inspire them, how much can I communicate a purpose of what we have and where we go with what I'm hiring is hugely important to building your team. The third part for diversity is now we looked at style, now we looked at personality, now we looked at alignment with goals, and the third part is the cultural sensitivity, and I don't mean just make the people that are working with you look all different. But I take that one step further to say, what's their cultural heritage? I spoke with Jared before we got uh, to sit down and enjoy some of the food about work that his uh, dad did in the automotive industry and I did for Audi in, uh, in Mexico. The little anecdote around that is, from a cultural sensitivity point of view, Audi Germany in Ingolstadt made the decision to build a Q5 and Q7 SUV in Mexico for the global market. Now that was all before terrorists and stuff like that. They had no clue that that might happen or not happen. So what did they do? And it doesn't sound wrong in the first place is they said, let's send a couple of hundred of the experts on every little thing that is required to build these vehicles to Puebla in Mexico and let's build this thing up. But naturally that's not sustainable. You might tell somebody do this for nine months, for a year, maybe a year and a half, but nobody from these guys in Ingolstadt in Germany want to permanently emigrate to Mexico. So there is a point where you have to switch over from predominantly driven by guys from Germany to let the place be run by guys from Mexico. That's what I mean with cultural sensitivity. If you wait too long and you have hired all the guys that are like the guys from Ingolstadt, and then you bring the Mexican managers in, what do you think how that's going to work? And again, it's not a matter of that the Mexican manager would the, do the job better or worse than a guy from Ingolstadt, just different. So you have to have a certain sensitivity of how do people approach things. My, my prime example is always when somebody says, okay, I'm a US business maker, a business um, owner or business leader, and I have the opportunity to have business in Norway, and I have the opportunity to have business in Mexico or somewhere in the middle of South America. In Norway, you say, okay, I'm gonna arrive on Monday morning at 10, I'm gonna settle down, on Tuesday morning at 8, we have the meeting, we talk about the things, we discuss what might not be quite right in the contract, at around 4 p.m. we probably sign or don't sign, and then on Wednesday morning, I'm on my plane back home. And I believe all of us being close to the border, if you were to try to approach that way, anything that you want to do in developing a relationship based on a contract anywhere in Mexico or South America won't work because the first answer is we don't even know who you are. So let's not talk about what's on the paper. Let's talk about how can we get to know each other. Cultural sensitivity. There's a good book for anybody who wants to dig really, really deep, like 1,200 pages deep. It's called Kiss, Go, and Shake Hands. That gives you an idea of what would be the best way to do business in any one of 192 countries around the world. But in your leadership, you also want to look at where people come from. How have they been raised? How does their style and their heritage inform how they're going to work? That brings in the ability to really have a great team. And even though sometimes in the news, I don't know if the Commodore has read that in the, in the past, globalization is suddenly not so much on vogue in the news anymore. I'm still a strong believer that ultimately we will all succeed as individuals, as businesses, and as a country if we reach out and work with others. Reach out and find a way to benefit from the talents that are out there in the world. And for a strong leadership team, my main job, I, I spoke to Jared and Dan about it is right now, my company goes out and I provide strategic support for companies here in our area who either want to bring something in from outside of the United States or bring something out. Like my biggest current project is a company in La Jolla transferring all their manufacturing to the United Kingdom. Not to China or Vietnam or something like that, to the United Kingdom. And why would they do it? Number one, tax reasons. But number two is to say, if we ever want to sell into the European market, we better be close by. Now they still have manufacturing in La Jolla too. 
But again, all these things that I have just introduced you to in this context of the diamond play a strong role for them for that project to be successful. And it's about a $100 million investment. So I would assume all of you would say, don't screw it up. <laughs> right. So back to my point of two dimensions down I-15, you, you're pointing your car in the mirror of the car next to you. The underlying thing of this diamond formation leadership and all these little aspects that I just touched a little bit on in these 15, 20 minutes is how to keep everything tight together and in good balance. Not too high, not too low, not one going ahead of the other and being detected by the radar on the ground. And when you do that, you really be, become like one blip on the radar. You become one cohesive team. And you will have the support by those members of the team whether things go well or things don't go so well. Because the number one component is not only are we making the shareholder happy or did we have profit this quarter, but is how did we actually perform as a group. And for me, I'm a big advocate of what I call transformational leadership. A diamond formation leader, I believe, needs to be a transformational leader, where you transform the people that, they, that you allow to join your team to have this kind of balance across those four diamonds. And then when you get there, and I encourage all of you to ask yourself, where do I have room to improve in collaboration, team building, cultural sensitivity, or globalization? I would bet that most of you have one or two of those already figured out. So you know where the other area is to work on and dig a little deeper. And the better you get in this, and this is then the closing remark and I open it up for, for any questions is, when you feel that you are pretty good in some of these areas already, don't ever stop polishing those diamonds. And those that still need a little pressure before they get diamonds, that's the ones that you want to work on more. And if anybody is interested to dig deeper, you have my contact information cards and so forth, and you can imagine there's way, way, way more than 20 minutes. So I could you know, talk to you about this and give you workshops and presentations for hours and hours and hours. But for now, I hope I gave you a little bit of an idea about the transformation of what you learn in the military into the day-to-day -day business world in San Diego County and beyond, and how it can apply to you. So I open it up for any questions. Yes, sure. So <clears throat> for those of us that haven't taken a, a personality or, or skills exam, where might we find those? There's three levels. The first one is, first answer, I guess that's probably the standard answer these days, is go on Google. <laughs> Just put in like personality assessment or style assessment and you will find a whole bunch for free. I want to caution a little bit, not because I say just because it costs money it's better, but a lot of those that you find there are relatively simplistic and might skew you a little. Then there is a level, a middle level, um, there are good companies like this. Um, there's a very good company in LA called CPP that offers a whole variety um, of different assessments for businesses. The one that I actually am certified to provide is two different ones. One is DISC for business and the other one is called a combination of MBTI which stands for Myers-Briggs uh, Inventory and Pyro B, which is a specific uh, assessment that um, the military had originally developed for NASA to find out who should become an astronaut. I don't know if you, say, if you remember some of you that initially all the astronauts came out of the military and the question was how do we pick? So a guy developed something called the Pyro B and CPP in LA actually offers a combination of MBTI, Myers-Briggs inventory and Pyro B specifically for business. And that's the second uh, layer where you can basically buy it for more or less money. And the third layer is, and, and that is a little bit up to what you want to do with it. If you just want to know where you are and how diverse you are, I would say second layer is fine. If you go one step further and say either immediately or I know this already, I have the impression there might be something wrong and I want to learn what's wrong. And then I really want to know what to do about it. Then the solution is to the second level but with somebody who is certified to deliver to. Because then the question might be, okay, so I find out I have only direct people, what do I do now? Or I find out the, the area that we're really lacking is communication, how do I get better at that? 
just knowing a law alone doesn't necessarily give you the solution, right? So those are the three layers, but I would say layer two or three, if you do that, that is probably, if you haven't done it, very enlightening. Thank you. I, I'd like to put a plug in for organizational or, or industrial psychologists as well who do this kind of work. Right. And, you know, they can be the communication experts, and sometimes that's what companies need. Also, just to clarify, you sort of said at, in, the, in your remarks to Gerald about you, you don't want a company that's all your style. You'll fail, you'll all go down in flames. Yeah. That a company needs to be balanced with the four styles, um, even though, you know, somebody in there talks for three hours and you're direct, you're drumming your fingers and blah, blah. They're, they're as important to the company as you are because they're going to catch things and discover things that you've zoomed right by. So I, I think that's where a lot of companies get into trouble. Oh, you think just like me, but no, you need that balance there. Yeah. And that's, I think, what you were saying. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree, and thank you for saying this in your own words. Um, I, I really meant it exactly that way. The point goes a little further when you go into the day-to-day. One example that I like to give is, if you are somebody who is pretty analytical and makes most of their decisions based on data, right, like how long does it take, how much does it cost, which supplies to any, that kind of stuff. And you say, you know what, I'm going to this fishing trip with, with Brad and I'm not going to be here at the end of the quarter, can you help me write this report that I need to submit to wherever? That sounds good. <laughs> person, right. So that person is, just happens to be one of those more innovative, creative storytelling. There's all kinds of different names for that quadrant. You give them the request, hey, you know, I think it would be a good developmental thing for you to write this report for the month and you find all the data here at the SharePoint file or folder or whatever it may be. When you come back, you're going to have an inbox full of stuff that is going to say from the people that normally get the report from you, what the heck happened? Somebody submitted this 15.5 pages long report with all kinds of pictures and graphics and stuff. We used to use spreadsheet and that little diagram, what happened? And what actually happened, and that's basically my translation to your point, is that you forgot that the person you're asking has a completely different style and because they want to do extra well, when you give them that opportunity, instead of writing it in five pages, they give you 15 pages just to be safe. You forgot that your style has become so normal to you that you didn't say, don't forget what I really need from you in this report. It's one paragraph, one worksheet, and a diagram. And if they're really strong, because you trained them well, they would say, you know what? Can I work with ABC, whatever the name of the other person is, because I suck at spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> But if you want me to write a story with great pictures and really some innovative ideas, I'm your girl or I'm your guy. That's where that really starts playing a role in the day to day. And I've I have found too many people when they've asked me to come in, say, can you help us find out what's wrong? That it's really not the ability to communicate, but what they communicate. Don't just say I want to report without saying what that thing is supposed to look like. All right, who else has a question? 